I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. Chris is joining us today. Chris, how you doing, buddy? Good, good. Well, you've got a lot to talk about, so I'm guessing let's let's kind of go back as maybe a refresher. We talked years ago, um, you know, and tell us about that that first encounter, and then just kind of take us through up till today and what's been going on. Yeah. Okay. So you know, growing up. Um, I really didn't think a whole lot. I, I do remember uh, Creature Feature when I was real little. My brother used to like to watch it. It was kind of after school or late in, in the Saturday afternoon. I do remember seeing that Patterson film of something, and it was so grainy. I really didn't think a whole lot of it, but I did. I do remember kind of you know, having a little eerie feeling about it, you know, but I never, like, after seeing it, I didn't think, like, I, it didn't burn in my mind every day after seeing it. It was only, um, you know, long, you know, just sum it up. My mom worked for pg and you know, that's a utility company here in, in California, Northern California. And um, we had company cabins out on a place called the Pitt River, in a place called Big Bend, California, in Shasta County. And uh, my parents started taking us up to those places, you know, to camp um, since I was four years old. And I do remember every time we'd get up there, because we'd go to the same camp every summer. And uh, it was crazy because we'd always see some of these other campers that show up at the same time. So it was really kindred. We'd run into the same people and continue playing where we left off from the year before. And I just remember having a feeling in that area, like right off the bat, I would pull my, um, my bed away from the window. It always felt like something was kind of looking in because it was uh, national forest. There was nothing around. There was a little playground. There was a volleyball court and a bunch of cabins, uh, like a big row of cabins, one on each side. And uh, they kind of got up to where the mountain went down to the river. And, um, you know, 17 miles away from the nearest highway. Anyways, uh, for years, I always had that weird feeling. And when I'd be playing on the playground, at you know, in the evening, and the kids would jump in, uh, go off the slide and jump off the swings and head in for dinner, I'd be like the last one swinging and then I'd get the hair up on the back of my neck and I'd run in. Well, fast forward to, um, when I was 15, I brought a friend who was also, he was from high school, 16, uh, to our camp, you know, for the week that we were going to be two weeks, we were going to be there. And, um, we snuck out like the kids did at that age and, uh, tried to, go and hang out with the girls from the other camps. We were just coming of age, trying to, uh, you know, grow up and do our thing. And some of the kids would steal beers or cigarettes from their family. And we'd go try and smoke them on the dam and play music. And uh, one um, evening, it was probably about 1130 at night, uh, we'd already played all the tapes that we had, the Led Zeppelin and the Pink Floyd. And... Um, my friend had this old Pink Floyd tape called Umaguma, and it had these animal sounds on this one song. And so we thought we'd be cute and play it out to nature. Like, you know, we'll play nature back to nature. And as we played it, even though it was a little boom box, we were sitting in the spillway of this dam, and the spillway caused a, a kind of an acoustic effect that amplified the, the radio, kind of made it echo. And um, we heard these screams, like these roars. I I just knew 
right off the bat that that was different from anything that I've heard in all the years that I've been up there in this area. And even my friend looked at me like, you know, with a little bit of alarm, like, what, what is that? You know, and we turned the radio down and we didn't hear anything for a second. At first, it sounded like it was a mile away. And then within a minute and a half, it had covered half the distance. And this is super rugged country. There's no trail along the river. I mean, people that trout fish usually avoid this river because you're going to probably end up, you know, if you're not careful with a broken ankle, just trying to get a line in the water. And um, this thing hauled. I mean, it, it took off and, and it was coming up. And then by the time it reached the end of the spillway, <clears throat> it was probably like this is a long spillway that went from the reservoir right off the cliff into the pit river. And the spillway is probably maybe about a city block long. And by the time we heard that thing coming up the spillway, we just grabbed the radio, we grabbed everything and we ran. We went back to camp and we were real startled, but also really relieved that we got away from whatever was making that noise. And we kind of joked around, what the hell was that Bigfoot? And, uh, we couldn't tell our parents because we were sneaking out. We would have got grounded. So we had to kind of hold that one in. And I just brushed it off as a fluke. Then three years later, and that was 1989, mid-August. And there was a forest fire that year. And it's one of those years where you could look up at the sun and you could see, you know, when it's going down, you could look at it without it burning your retina. Uh, so three years later happened to be, you know, the same time of the year we'd always go up, mid-August, and now it's 1992. I'm with my buddies from uh, high school, and we went and camped in a Forest Service campground down the road from my mom's pg and Cabin Association. And um, while we were there, we ran into some people uh, in town, some girls, and they were asking, hey, do you want to hang out after our parents go to bed? And we were dumb and young, and we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll hang out. <laughs> and uh, so we went to go meet up with these people, and um, I was kind of hitting it off with some girl from Oregon. I was, you know, having a good conversation, but my buddies had gotten drunk. And they kind of turned the women and they were trying to impress in the other direction. They were like, your buddies are drunk. And, but I was sober and I wasn't, you know, drinking that night. I wasn't having anything. And, um, anyways, I told them, Hey, you know, cause they're like, yeah, hey, we're going back to our beer coolers. And I said, well, wait for me. I'm going to get her number. And you know, they left, they split, they flat out ditched me out of jealousy, I guess. And so when I got our number, when I went to go to where our car was parked, they had left. So I ran back and asked her if she had a flashlight and she said she did, but the batteries were dead. And I went, Oh man, I said, look, I'll catch up with you in a day or two or whatever, but I got to go. And so I started my walk and I had about a five and a half mile walk down this logging road and about a third of the way in and I, I could, all I could think about was how pissed I was at my friends, you know, his asses. And so, you know, I'm walking and I hear a loud, like tree, like limbs snap, you know, this crunch. And I went, you know, I, I, in my head, I told myself, you didn't do that. You're on a dirt gravel road, what the heck. And, um, so anyways, I stopped. And, you know, I'm, all I have is this little big lighter. I don't have a gun or a knife and I'm just flicking my way down this logging road and trying to stay in the middle and using the cut in the trees to kind of stay centered. And so I stopped, I didn't hear anything. And then I took three steps. And as I did in sequence with my steps, I heard <laughs> And I stopped and then it stopped. So I took two steps. They went <laughs> in sequence with my step. I stopped and it stopped. And I took one step <laughs> and I went, uh, you know, like, okay. So my brain's trying to rule out what it is and what it isn't. And so in my head, I'm saying, okay, this thing's as heavy as a horse or a cow 
but it's uh but it's on two feet. I know what I sound like in the morning after I eat spaghetti the night before and have that cup of coffee in the morning. You know what's going to happen next. you got to go find a place to go to the bathroom in the morning. So I know my sound index, but this was like five to seven times what I sound like out in the forest. And uh, at that point, you know, my brain was just scrambling for an answer, and it kind of came across Bigfoot, you know, and I was like, nope. We don't believe in that. We're not going there. And then it was scrambling for an answer, and it came across Sasquatch. And that's when I just broke down. And I started to pray. I didn't have a gun or a knife. I hadn't been in church for a long time. Uh, but at that point, I was like, Dear Heavenly Father, you know, please make this go away. I'll put in an a hole to people. I'll try to quit smoking cigarettes. I'll try to go back to church. I was freaking out. And something told me, um, you know, keep walking, don't stop and don't try to look at it. You know, just keep walking, stay calm, but don't run. Uh, and you know, cause it was copying me. I figured if I ran, then I'd, I'd probably get something bad or worse would happen to me. And, um, you know, I, I kept walking, but it felt like my feet were on fly tape. It felt like each foot weighed a thousand pounds, putting one foot in front of the other. And I kept walking, I kept praying, and you know, I was hoping for some kind of distraction or intervention. And, and again, this is another year that happened to be another uh, forest fire a couple mountains over. It was the year of the Fountain Fire in Shasta that killed three firefighters. And um, anyway, I am walking. Luckily, I get to this spot where the power lines run through the forest. You know, mind you, this is PG&E land. And uh, I got underneath the, you know, power lines. There was a little red barn house underneath. And uh, I thought, you know, I could probably go ask these people for help. But then at the other spectrum of my head, my thinking, I was thinking, well, they're not expecting company at, you know, 12 o'clock at night here in the middle of the national forest and they're probably going to answer the door with a gun. So I was sitting there trying to figure out what I was going to do. I'm in the clearing now and I can feel that thing just sitting there lumbering right at the edge of the forest. I could hear it, you know, kind of breaking, you know, trees. And, and that whole time that it was stock walking me down the road, uh, it was breaking trees here and there, you know, like snapping those ones. We can bend like an ugly stick, but they don't break it was snapping them. And I was like, it was so intimidating that, um, I just didn't know what to do. And when I got under the power lines, I thought, you know, like I'm looking up at the sky, like, God, you know, you can't do this to me. I'm only 19, you know, they'll never know what happened to me. And, um, so I just, I kept, you know, try to stay cool. And I was praying, luckily this forest service truck came down the road. And I seen the headlights way, you know, kind of in the distance. And I thought, okay, I looked up at the sky and I was like, all right, oh, this is your prayer answered. Oh, run now. Oh, got it. <laughs> and I took off and I took off, man. I practically ran right out of my shoes. And, uh, I knew, I knew I had about another of a quarter of a mile through another dense part of the forest. But then as soon as I made it through there, um, it would open up. And it would be, you know, there was a clearing and it was right by the uh, pg and &E cabins. And um, I knew I'd be safe because there was firefighters in that field right below the reservoir. There was helicopters with their drop buckets and everything because uh, they were staging there for that fire that was a couple mountains over. So I figured if I make it that far, I'm okay. And I did. And I thought about, you know, maybe I could just stay underneath one of these uh, pg and &E cabins, even though we weren't there with my family, I figured, you know, what worse could happen. Somebody could wake up in the morning and say, what are you doing on our porch? And then I have to explain that I was part of the association, but I made it that far. And I figured, well, I can make it to my camp, which was another two and a half miles of walking through pitch black. And I did. And when I got back to my camp, uh, I didn't talk to my friends. I didn't tell them about it. I kept it to myself and I didn't know who, like, I just, I tried to forget it. 
I literally tried to like blow it off. Like it never happened. And, um, cause my friends were, they would have screwed with me. They would have been throwing rocks at my tent. They would have messed with me. And I had five more days of camping with those idiots. So I just said, uh, I'm just going to keep this to myself and never talk about it. And, um, then, you know, a couple of years later, 1995, I joined the California Conservation Corps. And during that time, we had to go through this thing called comet training, which was our version of the boot camp. And uh, during that boot camp, we had the Forest Service and the National Park Service as part of our uh, base. We all shared the, the same base together. And in the middle of the uh, after we were almost about done with boot camp training, they came out and welcomed us and uh, said that if we wanted to, you know, pursue that that uh, type of uh, um, career, to, you know, to talk to them. And they warned us about certain stuff. You know, the National Park Service warned us about uh, – Basically, uh, don't go take pictures next to the elk. They can hurt you, harm you, kill you. They said, uh, don't, you know, whenever you're walking out in the forest or whatever and you're tying your shoelaces, you know, look over your back. Make sure there's no overhanging limbs or, or rocks where there could be a mountain lion because that's when they'll go for you. And uh, they said, the bears really don't want nothing to do with you. If you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. And so at that point, you know, they said, uh, there's also one other thing. Does anybody believe in Bigfoot? And I'm looking around the cafeteria and I'm thinking, damn it. I came up here to work. I didn't come up here to, you know, deal with Bigfoot. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, it instantly took me back to my experience. So, I'm looking around trying to, you know, see who's got their hands up. And there was like 15 people with their hands up. And I, uh, you know, at that point I was, you know, my hand was down by my belt buckle. I just got out of commercial fishing and I didn't want people to look at me like, Oh, you know, he's, he's a guy that reads comic books and he believes they're real. You know, I just didn't want to be that guy. So I'm looking around, seeing who's, you know, got their hands up. And then they hand the mic over to this guy named Dan Ferrara. And he was a crew leader, but he was also part of the U.S. Forest Service with the Six Rivers uh, District. And he introduced himself and he said, hi, uh, my name's Dan. Glad you guys are integrating well with each other. And he says, uh, so, yeah, we have other things here. And uh, he said, you know, I wouldn't be telling you this if I didn't have my own experience to tell you. And basically, he was telling us about riding into Crescent City one night. And uh, he said that he had to take a leak. He was kind of in the summit area on the coast in between the town of Klamath Requa by the Trees of Mystery and Crescent City. He got up in the middle of, uh, you know, about halfway point, he stopped off to relieve himself. And he said, at that point, you know, a giant looking thing came out on two feet towards him. And he said that he had just enough time to get on his bike and pedal for dear life. And, uh, and I, he said he didn't hit his brakes till he hit Crescent City. Now, to me, that was crazy because it's a windy, wet road, and those trees are massive. If you slide off into one, you're gonna get you're gonna get killed. So, after that happened, I was thinking, "Geez, what are we? What have I got myself into? You know, I'm now a salmon and steelhead restoration specialist, but what have I got myself into?" And it wasn't long after being in there that. I would start to hear those same screams, those roars. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I, I knew something, but that, that wasn't what I was interested in. I didn't really have any kind of interest in pursuing it. So I just, after I got out of the CCCs, I, 
you know, I went about my daily life again and took several different types, you know, different employment after that. And it wasn't until probably around 2005, 2006, that these shows, Finding Bigfoot and all that stuff started coming on TV. And I realized something that I was taking my son to trout fish in the same area where I had that encounter up in Shasta. And at that point, something told me, you know, I probably, probably should tell my son what happened. And so I started researching it real, you know, heavily. And uh, at that point, I started to notice that once I, you know, I was listening to sound, I was looking on OregonBigfoot.com at first, and um, there was a couple of sound recordings. And so I was going through the sound recording to see what was what. And uh, when I did, you know, like the first two sound bites, they didn't sound like anything I'd heard. It was like the Ohio howl and something else. And then, uh, then all of a sudden I came across the, uh, the Klamath scream. And I, that's when I really like lost it. Cause I, I, at that point I could tell that's exactly what I had heard and I got goosebumps. And uh, then all of a sudden I see the Snohomish and the Puyallup screams. And I went, those are all the same thing. And if they're saying that this is Bigfoot, then I've heard it twice in my life. Then I started looking at uh, reports. And I was kind of falling asleep at the computer. It was kind of like an an AA meeting when you finally hear that story. That kind of goes, oh, shit. Yeah, that sounds just like my, my story, but it's somebody else telling it. And... All of a sudden, I'm hearing these people talking about getting stock walked down the road. And uh, then I'm hearing more reports of the screams. And I thought, you know, this did happen. And so that's when I finally went on the Sasquatch Chronicles. I found that. And uh, I started to learn a whole lot more. And I started hearing, all of a sudden, started hearing a lot more reports in those areas um, where I was, you know, Growing up in, in Shasta County, where I, you know, where the family was going on vacations, right in that vicinity, around there, around Bernie, California, all that. And then, you know, I was hearing stuff around the Klamath. I was looking at stuff all around that, and so I went, "Geez, this is this is bigger than I thought it was." And um, so I came out and finally put it out on the table and started to talk about it, and. Uh, I would later on have uh, uh, take a trip up to my brother's. He lived in Bend, Oregon. Me and my mom were there. Uh, we were going to do some fishing. And when we left his house, we were heading towards Crater Lake because I hadn't been there yet. And when we left the park after eating lunch at the lodge, um, we stopped off at the spot because I had to go to the bathroom real bad. And I got out of the truck. There was really no place to pull out. We were parked on a berm. And in order to be decent, I didn't just pee right there where everybody, where some motorist could come around the corner and see me doing my business. So I walked over the berm and I heard water. So I figured, you know, we're fishing and we're not in a rush. I decided to walk to where the water source was, about maybe a city block through the woods. And as I was taking my, you know, bathroom break, as soon as I zipped up and I turned to my left, I looked down and there was a barefooted footprint on the ground. And I want, you know, I'm a dad now and I'm thinking, well, what kind of idiot would let their kid, you know, walk around out here? There's all kinds of sharp volcanic rock and pine needles and pine cones and it's just not a place where you walk barefooted. And, and then I thought, you know, what kind of parent would let their kids stand next to these guardrails or next to this cliff where there's no guardrails and we're not in the park anymore. We're just in the national forest. And so I thought, damn, you know, it's flat footed too. So I thought, you know what, this is probably one of those things. I ran back to my truck, you know, and grabbed the uh, little 
cheap camera that you buy at the liquor store and took pictures of it and uh, would later get it signed by the people from Finding Bigfoot when I heard that they were in town over at the Bigfoot Museum in Felton. And um, so I would really started doing a lot of research. I started digging into it. It started to become like a, uh, a fascination, kind of like uh, I, I was almost obsessed with knowing everything I could, figuring out as much as I could. I just didn't want my kid to ever go through what I went through. And uh, later down the road, I ended up um, having to move because of the price gentrification thing in the Bay Area. Housing got really expensive. And so I moved out to Kern County. And um, part of the reason I went to Kern County is I have arthritis. I've been injured a few times and they had free hot springs in the National Forest. So I ended up going out there and found a place, you know, place to rent, and I was thinking about possibly buying a house. I wasn't going to be able to buy one in the Bay Area, but housing uh, homes were still relatively cheap out there. And so while I was out there, not thinking that there would be any kind of Bigfoot stuff going on, just out of curiosity, I looked on the BFRO database just to see if there was anything for Kern County. And there wasn't a whole lot, you know, of reports. There was about 12. And so I decided to follow up on one that was logged in by the Forest Service. I figured, you know, I'm going to go on the one that's the most credible. And so I uh, found this one. It was talking about... uh, the Forest Service conducting illegal OHV trails um, in in uh, October in a place called Weldon Meadow, and so I started looking at the map to see, you know, if I was able to access Weldon Meadow, and I could tell right away it was going to be a four by four uh, only road. But there was a road that went kind of close to it that was paved. So I decided to take the paved road and just see what I could see. I was just going to go out for the day and just look around. And uh, I got up above, I got up in this spot in this road where it got above, where you could look down on the wash, down on the creek area. And I saw these large indentions in the sand. And I thought, you know, what the heck is that? So I pulled over. And I decided I'm going to go take a walk down there. And as I went down to go take a walk, as soon as I came around the bend and and saw these impressions, I went, holy crap. What the heck? You know, these footprints. Uh, You know, the biggest one was about 17 and a half inches, you know, almost eight inches wide around that area. Went four and a half inches deep into the sandbar. I put all my weight on one foot and I could only get three quarters of an inch. Now, as I was following these tracks, recording with my phone, um, I noticed that there was also two more sets of tracks that were 14 inches that were about six and a half, seven inches wide and almost three inches deep in the sandbar. And as I'm following them, I'm noticing that they're following deer tracks down the creek and at some point they put the baby down I see five footsteps of the small juvenile five inches by two and a half inches wide and ironically just as deep as by 220 pounds you know three quarters of an inch and I'm thinking holy crap you know this is this is a family and uh so I document all this stuff. By this time, my dad's honking the horn, you know, wondering where I went. So I got back up to the car and told him, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to run back down and take a few more pictures. And I did. And we decided to go for a little bit farther down this road we haven't been on before. And we had just moved there. So like I said, we were just going down a lot of different roads just to see our new area. And, um, 
we got out to this spot called Jawbone Canyon. And right about there, we hit snow line. And I could see where something had walked across the road. At, four, at first, it looked like it was just a deer or an elk or something. So I pulled over and I got out of the car. And as I walked up to the snowbank on the side of the road, there was barefooted footprints. Now, mind you, the ones I found in the sand didn't have the toe definition. It, I must have got there probably maybe about a week before they had occurred, you know, before it happened. So they, you know, the, it kind of almost looked more like snowshoe tracks, but, you know, but I could tell they weren't. And um, when I got to the lawn up there down the road at the snowbank, perfect foot impressions. And I was, I was totally just like going, what the heck? And so I ended up, you know, going back the next day with the plaster, but by then snow had melted. I was real upset. Um, later on, I would uh, find more footprints out in a place called uh, Rabbit Island at the east end of Lake Isabella, um, basically where the south fork of the Kern River feeds into the lake. And it, it looked like, like the Everglades out there. You know, it was just real lush that year, 2019. We had some good rain. And um, I walked out to this spot in the thicket, in the sycamore swamp, and I found these flat-footed juvenile prints in the mud, you know, about 10 inches. And, you know, they were very flat and almost looked like they had claw toe points, like, you know, like claw toes at the, at the end. And... I followed them, you know, they were in a mud puddle on the road and, uh, and, you know, this little dirt road went right through the swamp and, uh, I couldn't take my car through there or I'd have got stuck in the mud, but I followed them to where they originated from and weird, weird enough, it was, it went out to these two circular spots in this green field and they, and they were perfectly circular and they looked like they're, it was burnt. Like there was, uh, and I'd say they were probably these, these circular spots were probably uh, about a 20 foot, you know, circ- you know, in circumference. Um, and I think, you know, maybe somebody had a burn pile here, but there was no charcoal wood or anything to, to look at, like where somebody had actually had a burn pile, but there was this weird crust this corrosion on the ground and uh it almost looked like battery terminal crust but kind of orangish like this mineralization of some sort but i I don't know what that was so i just thought wow you know you know some people like to do the bigfoot ufo connection i'm 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 not sold on it completely i mean if you connect some dots maybe there is something you know, I mean, I, I know that there was a Hopi legend um, where they called the, the Sasquatch silly bear because they said they saw a silver disc uh, come into their area and then three of these humanoids, hairy humanoids came out and they would eat with them sometimes at dinner, but at hold council and, but they walked up, right? So they called them silly bear. I thought that was interesting. So I don't know if there's anything to it. I just know what I experienced, you know, was just really very strange. And, uh, while I was there in Kern County, I was, I would talk to everybody that was, uh, kind of like the outdoors type, you know, I was at the hot spring almost every night. And, um, basically, you know, if you were a hunter or a fisherman or hiker doing the Pacific crest trail, I'd start asking people, you know, but I wouldn't ever say Bigfoot. I would just say, you know, oh, you do a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting, and you do a lot of this. And have you ever experienced anything strange or out of ordinary while you're out in the woods? And sometimes people look right at me and go, you mean Bigfoot? <laughs> and I'd say, well, I didn't want to say it, but yes, since you said it, yes, Bigfoot. 
And you'd be surprised the stuff that I pulled just from sitting there pulling information from people. Uh, a lot of reports in that area, talking to hunters that were, you know, saying that when they were in their 20s, they were up in the peppermint and uh, they are out with their 4 by 4s during the, the deer opener and, you know, they're parked in a meadow and in the middle of the night, you know, they're getting rocks thrown at their trucks and at first they're thinking it's their buddies pranking each other and then they realize it's not and and they end up just leaving. And, you know, for young people with high caliber weapons, uh, probably have beer, you know, they're high testosterone. It's not normal for them to just say, screw it, we're going home. And um, talked to an elderly guy who was a pack train, a mule pack train guy who would take people in the back country. He said he almost broke his knee running away from a big foot. Um, talked to... Uh, several people in uh, the, at the grocery store, this lady said that her and her husband um, were going up to this waterfall every spring when the, when the green gate opened because they'll close certain roads because of snow. And they were finding flat-footed, you know, barefooted footprints in the muddy snow out there to the waterfall on the trail. The first year they saw one pair and the second year they saw two. And, uh, then her husband said that one time he saw something being lifted in a net in a helicopter. They were pulling something out. He said it wasn't a bear, but it was black and furry. They were taking it out of the canyon. And uh, there was a recent report from this year where they were the Forest Service was ordered to go up and conduct uh, trail maintenance up in Alta Sierra. And they found a whole bunch of footprints on the trail in the muddy snow and took it back to headquarters. Um, my friend's wife told me about this because she knew uh, the guy who worked for the Forest Service was her landlord. And when they got back to the headquarters with their stuff on their phones, the, the boss basically said, I want everybody's phones here and made everybody erase what they had on their phones. And uh, so there's been like a, a lot of stuff, like there's been so many reports I never would have thought, you know, there would have been so much stuff going on in this area. Um, there was a lady who had this uh, incident on the spot in Lower Rich Bar with her friends when she was in high school. And uh, they basically, uh, they took off, they got out of there. And then and I thought, why would anything go there? And then, you know, cause there's not a lot of cover there. It's usually cows drinking underneath the shade of the cottonwood trees, but there's not a lot of cover. Some guy was up there catfishing from Bakersfield and they saw something. They saw the, saw the Sasquatch basically shaking this tree and broke it and then jumped in the river and was waiting towards them. And they got out of there. And then, then, they were so unnerved that they still wanted to fish. So they went back like three months later and uh, they went farther up to this place, Lower Rich Bar, the place where the lady Terry Rude had her encounter. And I was thinking, okay, now we're back at Lower Rich Bar. And so they heard the screams. They were out fishing at night. They had weapons, they had guns. But the screams they heard, they said, the hell with that. And they dropped the fishing gear and they ran. They said they were probably driving out of the canyon at 70 miles an hour, which is very dangerous. And um, they went back the next morning to get their gear back. And they ran into the Forest Service Ranger. And they asked them, you know, is, is there ever, you know, is there anything uh like what, what we're telling you, have you heard about stuff like this up here in this area? And he said, yes. Unfortunately, this is also the place where we retrieve most of the dead bodies that go on. People go into the Kern River thinking they can swim it. And a lot of times they realize it was a big mistake because it's a glacial runoff from Mount Whitney. It's very cold. And there's so many swift, just 
so many weird rock anomalies in underneath that water. Um, I mean, you can get pinned in, in, in a way that you're not going to be able to get out. And uh, I guess the guy said that that spot in the river is where is a tight horseshoe bend and, and the gravel bar becomes shallow. And he says that's where they usually find the people that go in. But a lot of people are never found that go in that river. And I thought, damn, I wonder if the reason that thing is going around that area is because it knows that cows, deer, all sorts of animals, people, they get in and they can't get out and then they float up at this one area and I think they know if they, you know, go near it and, and frequent it long enough that they'll score a meal and they'll probably take it to a more, re, you know, remote location where they can consume. And uh, so I wonder if that's the reason why we're having so many missing people from that river. I don't know. But um, just really eerie. Now, I did show my my videos to uh, the park ranger law enforcement and as well as the uh, fish and game, and they all agreed. Like one guy said, what the hell, where did you get this? You know, I said, well, kind of in this area. And he said, I knew these things were real. I just didn't know they were this far south. And, um, and then the other guy, he saw that and he, he said the same thing. Where, where, is, where, where is this? Where, where did you get this? And I kind of said the general area and he said, he goes, you know, I've been doing this job for 25 years. I know it sneaks, crawls, slithers, and walks through my county. But what you got on your phone, he said, that's something all the, altogether different than what I that I'm usually seeing. And uh, if you ever see this, you know, please come to the office and, you know, let me know. I'd like to go out and see it too. And uh, over time, you know, I just run into people. Um, I remember this girl, she wanted me to go get her dredge. Um, she had a gold dredge. There was a resort that was about to close down because it got bought out by uh, bigger hotel interest and um, she didn't want her dredge to you know go missing through the the whole uh, transition of all that so I told her yeah I'll go get your dredge I went up river to this resort and while I was grabbing the dredge I asked the caretakers hey have you ever seen anything strange or out in the ordinary out here or anything and the guy looked at me he goes Bigfoot? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, Bigfoot. And he said, oh, come over here. He goes, hey, Doug, this guy's asking about Bigfoot. And they went on to tell me that uh, one year in the fall, um, they were basically, it was usually that time of year, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, people, guests. But for whatever reason, this one fall, the whole resort was booked. It was full capacity of guests and they had the party lights out. People were drinking and reveling and it's evening. All of a sudden this thing comes down the Creek right by all the cabins, breaking trees and screaming bloody murder. And they said that all the guests had gotten so unnerved that they went over to the caretaker's office and they were kind of sitting there huddled by the caretaker's office, rocking back and forth, kind of going, what the hell, you know, we didn't pay for this. And, uh, that told me, you know, I, I, you know, so I was like, that's where I kind of had my first encounter was right by the power line. And, um, so, you know, so, and, um, so, I started looking at these reports for Kern County and I noticed that there's nothing in the summertime and it's hotter than a hell bell in the summertime out there. I mean, the average temperature is 105 to 108 throughout the summer into the fall. Now, where's the reports? So I looked to the north 
up in the high country, and there's huge clusters of reports for Fresno and Tulare County up above Shaver and Huntington Lake. And uh, so I'm figuring, like, after doing all this research, you know, and like that thing, when it came down through that resort, that's coming down from the high sequoias in the fall. And uh, they start working their way south for the winter. And I came with this theory, you know, like to kind of follow follow the dots. Um, so there's Fresno and Tulare County is summertime. And then as the fall progresses, we start getting the reports in the Lake Isabella area. And as it starts to progress towards winter, it starts going out to Tehachapi and Fraser Park area where you start getting reports over there. And um, so, you know, when that thing came down uh, through that resort, I think it was communicating with the people like, hey, I'm used to coming through here at this time of the year. This is my route to go to where I need to go. But you guys are in the way. And if you get in my way, you're going to end up like this, like the broken tree. And um, so it's like Fresno, Tulare County, summertime, uh, fall, current starts to funnel into Kern County, and then and starts getting towards uh, as the winter, almost out to San Bernardino County. And we start getting reports out in the desert, like Edwards Air Force Base out there in the, on the Mojave Riverbed in the, in the middle of winter. Uh, places I started finding things that, and then as the, because uh, I had a friend of, I worked with the Forest Service on the volunteer level, and, and our guy that we coordinated with said his son saw one cross the road going south in the fall, too. And I talked to another guy who said in, in uh, June, he lived up on, on Sawmill Road, um, that he saw one that was going up towards the high country. So I'm thinking it's like a big circular motion that these things are happening. Um, and throughout our canyon, there's uh, petroglyphs that are obviously that of Sasquatch. They're the same as you have at Painted Rock in Tulare County in Porterville, which, mind you, is only 40 miles north of me as the crow flies. Uh, where they have that famous pictograph, the hairy man pictograph. And uh, I started, because there's a girl that worked at a grocery outlet, and she started showing me these petroglyphs, and I was blown away. I saw a couple of them, and I went, those are exactly the same as the ones at Porterville. So I asked her if I could, you know, get copies of them. And I showed Kathy Strain, and she got pissed. She wanted to know exactly where they were. She said, where is this? You know, I need the location. The location. And I said, I can't give it up. And I said, these are exactly like those over a quarter. She said, no, they're not. Just stop. Just stop. And she said, just stop. And she hung up like, like she did stop the conversation. We were texting. And uh, but, but before she did, she said, I got to get a hold of my archaeology department. So obviously she was highly interested, <laughs> but she was also like a little, little irked because I think she wanted that for herself. Or, I don't know. Um, it just happened that way. And uh, but anyways, yeah, this, uh, there's so much stuff going on that I would have never have thought. And when I started to kind of do a geological, uh, kind of like a survey, you know, with Google Earth, I noticed something. And I came to a strange conclusion that even though Kern County only has 12 reports on the BFRO database, there's still other reports, um, you know, I heard this one on uh, Bigfoot case files. It was uh, the episode where it says they hang their prey in trees. And at minute 312, it says, Weldon, California, 1975, cattle rancher looking for his lost steer finds his cow, full-grown steer, 12 feet up in the crook of a tree, neck broken, partially eaten away, 
21 inch tracks leaving the scene. You know, everything keeps pointing to this Weldon area, and that's where I've been finding these footprints every December. And um, if you follow this creek, this wash through this area called Kelso Valley Road, um, it will eventually lead out to Jawbone Canyon. And if you go through Jawbone Canyon, you get out to Tehachapi and Fraser Park. And so, like I was saying, looking at Google Earth, I realized something that Kern County may be, just may be, one of the most important Sasquatch research areas in California. And the reason I'm saying this is if you look at Google Earth at California, there's only two counties where these creatures can transition from the eastern mountain range into the western Pacific mountain range without being put at a disadvantage of being seen. Uh, and, and the other county is Shasta County. You know, where all they have to do, basically from North Shasta Lake, to the town of Weed, if they want to, tr- you know, transition over from Shasta into Siskiyou's and get out there towards the coast, all they have to do is cross Highway Five in that area around Dunsmere, Castella, um, in that area, Castle Crags. They can they can just cross Highway Five, and they're done. They they pulled it off. Down in Kern County, all they have to do is follow the end of the Southern Sierras, it starts to get skinnier and skinnier and it fans out to the West like a scorpion tail. And then you, it goes right into the Angeles national forest, or if they want to continue going further South towards the desert, they can go along the San Gabriel's and they are still, you know, have plenty of cover. And, um, to me, that's fascinating, you know, just to think that, you know, they're using these, these routes, to their advantage. And um, I just, I I realized that these things are in areas that I never thought that they would be in. I just, when I had my, you know, experiences young, as a young man, and when I started researching, if it wasn't centered in the Pacific Northwest, I wasn't even trying to like really pay a lot of attention to it. If it was down in Florida or Texas or, East Coast. I wasn't. I was only focused on my neck of the woods, which is the PNW. And uh, now I, I know they're everywhere. Now I know they're out there in Texas. I know they're in Louisiana. I know they're in Florida. I know they're. In, I know they're everywhere, anywhere, with a certain amount of rainfall and cover. Only upon moving to Kern County, I came across this video of these. Uh, guys that were riding their ATVs out on the dry Mojave riverbed. And I thought, what in the hell? These guys are finding giant footprints in the, in the dry wash, like the ones I found. Why would they go there? You know, this is outside of Victorville, California in the desert. Why would they go there? You know, what's out there for them? And I thought, you know, it's got to be the winter time. And I looked at the time of the year that that video was taken. It was the dead of winter. And I thought, well, why there? And, you know, I followed the the Mojave River to its source, and it went up to Lake Arrowhead. And so I had to think about it. What's out there? and Where's the water if they need it? And then it dawned on me. When my mom, when I was a real small boy, my mom took me to see this foreign film. It was called Walkabout, and it was about an aborigine. Um, and there was a European woman and her son. They broke down in their VW in the outback, and the boy was terribly sunburnt, and they were both dying of thirst. They were sitting under this tree that doesn't, wasn't providing very much shade. And the aborigine saw the kid and the, the woman, his mom, And he immediately came to their aid. He saw the kid burnt up and he took his boomerang and he knocked out a kangaroo and he split it open and was rubbing the gut grease on the child to soothe the kid. And then he took the the mom and the kid out into the middle of this dry wash and he found a bush that was green 
and he started digging down in the middle of this drywall next to this bush that was, you know, still kind of thriving. And at about two feet, he struck water and he used like a little reed, like a tube, and he, he pointed to them, he like drink, and he saved their life. And I thought, you know, I bet these creatures know to do the same thing. If they're thirsty, even if they're out in the desert, they go out into a wash and they see a green bush, they probably know they got to just dig down and they'll get their, they'll be able to get some, some liquid. And, uh, so as I followed the Mojave river up to its source, the Lake Arrowhead, I went thinking that there wasn't any Sasquatch that far South. And, uh, I started to realize that they're everywhere. Have there's, um, they have a thing called Takwitz. It's, uh, Takwitz Peak. And Takwitz is the name of a Sasquatch in Paiute language and Kahuya uh, Indian language. They named it in the San Jacinto mountain range. And it's not a good legend. It's a terrible legend. Like they talked about this thing that used to be peaceful and taught the tribe remedies on, uh, you know, to, to heal themselves from seemingly ordinary plants that grew around the area. And uh, at, you know, some point it became sinister like to scare little children and so they had banished it and then it started eating people from the tribe and, and uh there was a great battle between the chief and this thing and uh but it had killed his son and i mean it was uh it's not a good it's a terrifying legend you can access that by going on to youtube i didn't even want to put them on youtube um, I wanted to keep my area, so I don't even say exactly, you know, where it's at on YouTube when I'm doing it. Uh, but I, uh, you know, I didn't want to put it on YouTube, but last year, about a year and a half ago, my Facebook account got hacked. And I almost lost, I don't know, somebody from uh, Africa, you know, I, I think it was uh, like uh, around the Congo or Nigeria. Or I, they were trying to extort me for... Uh, you know, Apple gift card, and I didn't want to give up $500 Apple gift card to get back my um, my account. So I was lucky to get my, my videos back, and I put them up on YouTube so that they'd be preserved forever. And so if you go to Kern County Sasquatch by Christopher Contreras, you will come across a series of videos, and uh, you can see, you know, basically four years worth of research. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, very, 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 very much. Um, okay. Chuck, are you there? Yes. Yes, I am. All right. Uh, Chris. Okay. Um, Chuck, any questions or comments? I, I just want to say, Chris, thanks for coming on the show with us and, and man, um, your research and your stories that you've got from up in that area is uh, pretty amazing. And, um, you know, we got, we got some areas like that down here in Texas and Oklahoma as well. So we, we know, we know how that goes for sure, but thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I appreciate being able to collaborate with you, Will. It's been a long time since I talked to you and just knowing that, you know, about those screams from your time out there at Fort Lewis, um, you know, I, I know that you know the same stuff. It's weird on the BFRO that they're saying it's coyotes, but no, we, we, we know better. And uh, I collaborate a lot with uh, John Freitas, the Sonoma County Sheriff, who does the deception detection techniques. And, um, yeah, we, uh, we we all know what we know. I mean, I had a guy from uh, uh, out here, a place called White House Canyon. He was begging me to get on, get a hold of him because... People on the Coalition for Critical Thinking of Bigfoot were saying, no, you heard coyotes, and he was on 57 acres out in the Redwoods, and he was hearing those screams. And he said he went out there with uh, back in 1980 when you could still have all the, the big clips, uh, you know, his, his 223, his ranch rifle, the Mini-14, he had 80 rounds, you know, two 40-round clips duct taped to each other. And he said this thing screamed at him so loud that he got the hell out of there, and, and he didn't want to even—he didn't think his gun would even do anything. So I said, "No, you heard what we—you know what we've heard. And if it was coyotes, you wouldn't have been worried with eighty rounds of two-two-three. So yep. 
you know, don't worry. Don't let them bully you. <laughs> All right, Chris, listen, thanks, buddy, and stay in touch. All right, my brothers, you have a good one. All right, you do the same. Bye-bye. I know. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>